Let's turn to the word of the Lord to uh, the book of Judges as we are uh, continuing to go through this uh, very unusual book of God's word. Uh, Israel has, uh, is in the land. Israel has had 40 years of peace from any oppressors uh, after the deliverances of the days of Deborah and Barak and, and Jael. Uh, but here we go at it again. Uh, it's, uh, we're back to the same old, same old sin cycle uh, in chapter 6. Israel is doing evil in the sight of the Lord. And the good news is God is still there uh, to send another judge, another savior. And this time it is Gideon. Uh, most of us have heard of Gideon, uh, Samuel probably, both of those two very popular judges. Actually, the book of Judges spends the most time on Gideon than any of the other judges. Three whole chapters. Now, if you're a Bible buff, you'll know that it's, uh, Judges has four chapters on, on Samuel, uh, no, uh, Samson rather. And uh, the reason for that is... Uh, it's, Gideon is longer because it's it, uh, 96 verses on, on Samson and 100 verses on, on uh, Gideon. So it's a little bit more on Gideon than Samson. Uh, but chapter 6 is about preparation. Chapter 6 is about preparing uh, Gideon and the Israelites for a battle that will come up uh, following this. So I want you to listen for how God prepares his people, how God prepares Gideon. I want you to listen as I read to the sequence of events. I want you to listen also of what this story tells us about our Lord. And so hear the word of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord from uh, Judges uh, chapter 6. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And for seven years, he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive... The Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count the men and their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, This is what the Lord, your, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I snatched you from the power of Egypt and from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them from before you and, and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live. But you have not listened to me. The angel of the Lord came. And sat down under the oak in Ephra that belonged to Joash, the Abbey's right, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. But, sir, Gideon replied, If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? But Lord Gideon asked, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites together. Gideon replied, Now if I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. 
Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. Gideon went in, prepared a young goat, and from an ethic of, of flour, he made uh, bread without yeast. Putting the meat in a basket and its broth in a pot, he brought them out and offered them to him under the oak. The angel of God said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened bread, place them on this rock, and pour out the broth. And Gideon did so. With the tip of the staff that he was in his hand, the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread. Fire flared from the rock, consumed the meat and, and the bread, and the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Ah, oh, sovereign Lord, I've seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid. You are not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day it stands in Ophrah of the Abbeites. That night, same night, the Lord said to him, Take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old. Tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on the top of this height. Using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down, offer the second bull as a burnt offering. So Gideon took ten of his servants and did as the Lord told him. But because he was afraid of his family and the men of the town, he did it at night rather than in the daytime. In the morning when the men of the town got up, there was Baal's altar demolished with the Asherah pole beside it cut down and the second bull sacrificed on the newly built altar. They asked each other, who did this? When they carefully investigated, they were told Gideon, the son of Joash, did it. The men of the town demanded of Joash, bring out your son. He must die because he has broken down Baal's altar and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. But Joash replied to the hostile crowd around him, are you going to plead Baal's cause? Are you trying to save him? Whoever fights for him shall be put to death by morning. If Baal really is a god, he can defend himself when someone breaks down his altar. So that day they called Gideon, Jeroboam, saying, let Baal contend with him because he broke down Baal's altar. Now all the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples joined forces and crossed over the Jordan and camped in the valley of Jezreel. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, summoning the Abirites to follow him. He sent messengers throughout Manasseh, calling them to arms and also to Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali. So they too went up to meet him, them. Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have promised, look, I will place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. If there is dew only on the fleece, and all around the ground is dry, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you said. And that is what happened. Gideon rose early the next day. He squeezed the fleece and wrung it out the dew, a bowl full of water. Then Gideon said to God, Do not be angry with me. Let me make just one more request. Allow me one more test with the fleece. This time make the fleece dry and the ground covered with dew. That night God did so. Only the fleece was dry. All the ground was covered with dew. So ends the reading of God's word. Let's, let's pray together. Lord, we ask that you would be with us. Story uh, that we may have heard as children. We hear it today again. And we ask that you'd help us. You'd help us look for uh, truth there that would apply to where we are. For your word is always speaking and you are always working by your spirit as it's read. 
And so, Lord, we ask that you might now help the preacher be with his weakness, uh, strengthen him, that he might declare who you are and what your word says. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know why, but as I read this passage this week, it reminded me of Johnny Carson, the king of the talk show hosts. Uh, back in the 70s or 80s and whatnot. And he had a, a nightly uh, monologue, as late night uh, guests or uh, hosts do. And he would regularly, if you have never seen him, you see him on YouTube or whatnot, uh, he had sort of an interactive comedy style. And he would say something like, it was hot in Los Angeles today. And the audience would respond, how hot was it, right? And then Carson would rattle off a number of one-liner, humorous one-liners about it was so hot that blank, 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 blank. And without the humor, the writer of Judges is doing something very similar. In the days of Gideon, he was really telling us how bad it was. It was this bad. It was that bad. It was so bad that they had to hide in the clefts and in the rocks and in the hill country and strongholds and forts. It was so bad that they couldn't harvest their crops every year. They'd plant them, but then the Midianites would come and take them away. It was so bad that the Midianites stole all their livestock. It was so bad that, that they couldn't even count the enemies. Did you notice that? They were like locusts on the land swarming everywhere, too many to count, too overpowering to resist. And then did you notice that little line they had, the camels? Camels were important things. They weren't things at the zoo that we would see now. This was the fast and the furious had camels. Uh, the fast, furious camels that would go and would not run out of gas. Israel didn't have the camels. The Midianites did. And it was so bad that they were threshing out the grain in a wine press. I don't know if you noticed that in verse 11. In other words, they were taking what normally would be done outdoors where you would thresh out grain and you would throw it up and the, the wind would blow the chaff away from the grain. They were doing it in a wine press, not only a smaller area, but usually done inside. There was no place, there was no wind to do it. They were doing it inside because they were hiding. They were so fearful of the Midianites. And this was going on for seven years. Not an occupation like we've seen in the other stories before this, but a, a seasonal explore, exploration and exploitation of, of them. They would, would come into the land, they would, would camp out there at harvest time and they would ravage the fields. And then they would leave again. They were like a nomadic raiders that would come along. And you remember Midianite, you don't remember where that was. So that was where Moses spent the 40 years, his middle years uh, in Midianite. He met Jethro and, and married Jethro's daughter. That's where the Midianites, down from the south, they would come in. And they would come in with great uh, fierceness. And finally, Israel cried out to the Lord, cried out to him. And the Lord does what? Does he raise up a warrior? No. Does he send a savior? No. He sends them a preacher. Did you catch that? Before a savior comes a preacher, uh, a prophet who would speak the word. You know, in some ways that's like being out on the highway and you're called AAA and they send you a philosopher. You know, and they, they kind of go, well, let me tell you about Aristotle and what his views were. You know, you need, you need a mechanic. You need someone who can do the job and get your car going once again. And the Lord sends a prophet, a speaker of his word. But it was exactly what they needed. They needed to be reminded of God's word of what God had done for them, of, of who they belonged to, of who had, had they served, of, of what he desired. Did you notice all those the list of things he goes through? It's a covenantal statement, restatement, a historical prologue, and a, and a statement of who God is. And, and, and law and gospel is there in those verses. He reminds them of, of whose land they really were on and how they had really caused these locust raids themselves. 
and that they won't be able to resist, really. There will be nothing that will really change until they come back to this. And then, you know, the same thing is true for us. We need a preacher. We need a prophet. Even preachers need preachers. We, when we're caught in our sin, when we're not, res not resisting sin, when we're oppressed by the enemy, when we're overcome by uh, the evil powers of age, we need the word. We need a sermon. The word that, that convicts and convinces and, and comforts. The word that cuts and heals. The word that tears down and builds up. We need law and gospel. Notice the, those verses. Law and gospel is there. He tells them what the Lord has done for them and gospel. And then he tells them the law and tells them how they have failed him. We need to hear what God has done for us each and every week. We need to hear how he had saved us each and every week. We need to hear how God, who God is to us, that we are in covenant with him. We're not on our own. We're not just sent out there alone. No, he is with us. We need to again remind ourselves as his word convicts us that we have failed too. We need God's word. We need it read. We need it preached. We need it meditated on. We need it studied. We, we need it seen in the sacraments. We need God's word. Martin Luther put it this way. He said, the soul can do without all things except the word of God. We might think you don't need it. You might think you know what's in that book. You may say to yourself, I've read it through several times. I know what's coming around every corner. But you need that word. When we're preparing for the battle, when we're getting ready, we need the word of the living God. We need him. So you wouldn't expect the prophet. And also in verse 11, you wouldn't expect verse 11. After telling them that he, they have done evil in his sight, that they have not listened to him, there's no judgment. It just stops. It just stops right there. There's no discipline. You would expect some kind of covenantal action. You expect some kind of covenantal curses. You expect the shoe to drop here. You would expect God to tighten, as one person put it, tighten the screws on Israel so they'd really repent. You would expect the angel of the Lord to come, as he did in chapter 2, and, and give his covenant indictments, but you don't hear any of that. You just hear of the angel of the Lord coming and sitting down under an oak tree. Now, this is a particular oak tree. It's Joash's oak tree, and his son is Gideon. It's uh, Gideon's father's oak tree. And the word, the first word comes out of his mouth. The Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. You are a mighty warrior. In other words, God is going to rescue his people once again. That God never, ever gives up on his people. We, this is the message of Judges. It's the message of the scripture. A major theme all the way through. That God is slow to anger. He's slow to anger with you. God doesn't see you as you really are. He sees you as you will be in him. Gideon might answer, I'm no warrior. I'm kind of a chicken, actually. I, I thresh indoors. <laughs> and, uh, and when he was told, you know, when he was told to go out and, and, and tear down the altar, he does it what? In the broad daylight? No, at night. This is the kind of person Gideon is. He's no warrior yet. He was a farmer. He was a doubter. And he begins to spout off his doubts. If God is with us, why are we being ravaged by the Midianites? If God is with us, why is everything against us? If God is with us, where are all the miracles? Where is the power? He's asking. If God is for us, why has he abandoned us? And we can act like that sometimes. We can look at life that way. We can look at our circumstances that way. And we want God to come in and take that problem out of our, our uh, lives rather than to see ourselves as maybe the person God wants to form into facing that problem and solving that problem. 
And so Gideon does. And notice that God doesn't answer his questions. He just simply calls him to go in the strength, and the strength that he has, and do what God wants. That's all God is asking of you. Go in the strength that he has given you, and do what he's called you to do through his word. And notice the question of the Lord there. Am I not sending you? In other words, I am is sending you. <laughs> the great I am, the Lord, the God of the mighty is sending you. He sent you into your vocations. He sent you into the families you're in. He sent you uh, everywhere you go by his providence. And that God is sending you and he will give you all that you need. One of my favorite stories, and I maybe I've told you this before, is if I was about 19 years old, and I was sitting in the back seat, coming home from church with my dad. He was driving, and mom was driving. Somehow the subject of children came up, and I, I boldly proclaimed, I will never, ever have children. <laughs> and my father didn't mock me and said, you're, you're, you're just being a uh, kooky kid, Gary. And he didn't argue with me. He just said that when the time comes for you to have kids, Ron, God will give you the grace to have them. <laughs> he called it baby grace. He says, God will give you baby grace, and then he'll give you grandfather grace or whatever. All through your life, he'll give you dying grace eventually. He'll give you what you need, the strength that you need when you need it. And that's really what Gideon is being told here. He's being really uh, uh, challenged. Why, why are you so worried about things? I'm with you. I'm going with you. God doesn't say to us, I'm sending you out and you're just on your own out there. Figure it out. He says, I will be with you. That's a promise all through the scriptures that God will be with his people. And you can go anywhere with that promise. You can do anything God wants with that promise. You can go down any road that he wants you to go down with that promise. In fact, he wants us to go everywhere with that promise. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. I will be with you to the end of the age. This is what God promises us. But look at verse 15. Gideon is not buying it. There's got to be some mistake here. You've got the wrong Gideon. There are a lot of names Gideon. There's several names like that. You've got the wrong tribe. You've got the wrong clan. We're the weak guys, he's saying. We're the family that hides in caves. You, you don't understand. Basically what he's saying is, here I am, Lord, send someone else, is what he's saying. And this sounds like us a lot of the time, doesn't it? Uh, there's great parallels. I won't go in time to do that, but this week or sometime when you have some time, uh, look at Exodus chapter 3 and 4 and, and notice how the Lord deals with Moses at the burning bush. It's very similar, very similar to how he, the Lord is dealing, the angel of the Lord is dealing, and the Lord is dealing with him at this point. Moses says, who, I am, who am I that I should go? And then the Lord tells him, no, you're, you're, you're going to be fine. And then he, he says, what, will they, what, what if they don't believe me? What do I tell them? And the Lord says, I'll tell you my name. And then he says, let him slow asleep speech. And then he says, oh, Aaron will come and be with him. Finally, Moses at the end says, literally, oh, Lord, please send someone else. That's what he says. Uh, and this is basically what Gideon is doing. God comes back in verse 16 to the very same promise he wants to draw it into our hearts that he will be with us. And then he even expands the prophecy for, for Gideon that he will, will take down the Midianites as one man. We'll see that as it comes up. But Gideon wants a sign. A sign that God is really speaking. A sign that the angel... Uh, speaks for the Lord. So he makes a meal. We don't quite know why, what he's getting at here, but he makes a meal. He basically says, stay right there, Lord. I'll be right back. And that's what he basically says. And Gideon, uh, of course, couldn't go to McDonald's and grab some fast food. He had to uh, butcher and roast and bake. It would take a while. The miracle is not so much that the fire comes down and consumes the meal once he makes it, I find in this passage, the miracle really is that the Lord waits for him. Think of that. This is God Almighty waiting for a man to put together a meal. 
He waits. See how patient God is. It's one of the themes of this chapter. God is patient with his people. And, of course, Gideon is convinced by the fire. And the angel, he also convinced that the Lord, the angel of the Lord was, was meeting God face to face. That's basically what he's saying there. And then he's facing another problem, and that is that he's been in the very presence of God. And he thinks he's going to die. He won't live. Based on Exodus 33, 20, that the Lord says, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. I've been telling you about this book. I hope you'll get it sometime. Of, he has a number of, of these devotional commentaries. Uh, Ralph Dale, uh, Dale Ralph Davis, uh, finally. DRD is how I have to remember it. And he comes in at this point uh, about uh, uh, Gideon's fretting about uh, being in God's presence and think he's going to die. He says this, We Western Christians do not understand Gideon's agony. Such talk is strange to us. We long to reach our warm hand through the print of our Bible page, pat Gideon's shoulder and soothe him with, don't worry, brother Gideon, God's not really scary like that. If only you had a New Testament, my brother. Uh, A pained, perplexed look would come over Gideon as if he had had just just heard a theological ignoramus. Ignoramus? I think that's it. Uh, This sort of talk is strange to us because we have no real sense of the terror and awesomeness of God. For we think intimacy with God is an inalienable right rather than an indescribable gift. There is nothing amazing about grace as long as there is nothing fearful about holiness. That's a great line. There is nothing amazing about grace as long as there is nothing fearful about holiness. He felt sense that he was in the presence of God and could not live. And without the Lord's promise, without the Lord's salvation, that's true of anybody. And so the Lord reassures him, my peace is yours. He's not talking about an inner peace here. He's talking about we have peace together with one another. Don't be afraid. It's the same thing as what we hear in the gospel. The word of the gospel comes to us and tells us we're not going to die because Jesus has died for us. So Gideon builds the altar to remember this and and the Lord keeps speaking that night. And so really what we find here are, if you're trying to track with me, I hope you are, the the first way we prepare to go into battle, the first way which we prepare to go into a fight each day we fight is through the word, the law and gospel, the word that we need in all its aspects. That's the first point. The second point is we prepare through the patience as we, we deal, and God deals with our doubts. We're going to have doubts and fears along the way, and God will be patient with us and work with us through those. And then thirdly, now, look at verse 25. The third way in which we prepare to go into battle is through getting rid of our idols. Gideon had to put his house in order first before the fight, before the battle. And there was a town altar of some sort to Baal. His dad apparently was the priest. The bull was most likely a bull already set aside for sacrifice to Baal. And the point is there can't be two altars in the land. There can't be two gods and lords of your life. No matter what people are thinking, no matter what the whole town is saying, and so Gideon, interesting, we come out with the word Gideon. You know what the word the name Gideon means? Hacker, chopper, one who breaks to pieces is really what the word means. And so he breaks to pieces this altar. And therefore he gets another name for the contender with Baal. Uh, and, and another time, he thinks he's going to die. <laughs> The second thinking about dying in this story, the whole town is in an uproar. They come after him. They find out that ten servants uh, squeal, and they tell about, oh, it's it's Gideon, it's Gideon. And they come to the doorstep of Joash. And it reminds us, doesn't it, of the world. When we we start to get rid of idols, the world is always threatened by that. The town, our town, will be in an uproar when we get rid of idols. When plurality is threatened, 
the world will try to make us pay. And Gideon's dad here is making, it appears to be making a spiritual comeback. Fight for Baal and you'll die by tomorrow morning, he says. He says, secondly, love, love the question, basically in all those questions, what kind of God has to be saved? What kind of God, if it's true, will have to be saved by us? One person I read this week remembered, reminded me of a story of John Knox, the great Scottish reformer. And when Knox wasn't always reforming and preaching, he was in a galley. He was a galley slave for a while. And while being a galley slave, he was ordered um, to uh, pay reverence to a painted figure of the Virgin Mary. And he picked it up and he threw it into the river. And he made this comment. Let our lady now save herself. She is light enough. Let her learn to swim. And this is what, what really what Joash is saying. He's saying, if God is, if there, these things are God's, and they will not have to be defended in any way, shape, or form. And it wakes God's people up, this rebuke. It wakes them up. And we need to be wakened up about idols. They creep into our lives so easily. And they must go no matter what. We must serve no one, no one, and nothing but the true and living God. We must trust no one and nothing but the living God. Only God is God. Only God must be. Be God to us is really what it is. And the part of our fight throughout all our journey is going to be getting rid of these idols. And idols, as we've said before, are not bad things necessarily. Most of the time, they're good things that have gone bad. Idols are good gifts of God, of God's creation. Good things that, that we make ultimate, that we, make, we take good things and we make them ultimate things. We take good things and we make them eternal things. Idolatry is being satisfied with creational things rather than the creator. Idolatry is, is worshiping those things rather than him. It's really a, a dual devotion. It's a, a God plus theology. It's, as uh, Tim Keller calls it, a, a, God, a God alternative, a counterfeit God is what an idol is. He went, goes on in his book, great book about this, uh, Counterfeit uh, Gods. He says, we think that idols are bad things, but that is almost never the case. The greater the good, the more likely we are to expect that it can satisfy our deepest needs and hopes. Anything can serve as a counterfeit God, especially the very best things in life, family, and career, and, and good things, and food and all those things. He went on and said, you're, you're nothing till, uh, we're, we're told, you're nothing till someone loves you. That's, a, I guess, a line in a popular song. And we are an entire culture that has taken that literally. We maintain that the fantasy that if we find our one true soul made everything wrong with us, we'll be healed. But when our expectations, hopes, and hopes reach that magnitude, the love object is God. No lover, no human being is qualified for that role. No one can live up to that. The inevitable result is bitter disillusionment. Your idols will always fail you, Christian. They'll seem like they won't. It will look like they won't. But in the end, they will fail you. And even all the way through, they'll fail you. And so... We've got to get rid of the idols if we're going to go into the battle as Gideon did. Now, fourthly and finally, look at verse 33. The Midianites are back again. The Midianites are back uh, with, for an eighth season here. Uh, and God's spirit clothes Gideon. And in fact, literally in the Hebrew, it says the spirit clothed himself with Gideon. <laughs> Just the opposite of what it's translated. It really literally is the spirit takes Gideon on to be his instrument is the idea. And he rallies the troops. And we would expect to go right into a battle scene, but we don't. Gideon box. Gideon asks for a second sign. And we, of course, say, Gideon, come on. What, 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 why do you need another sign? What's the problem? Or even more so, what's a fleece? 
what's a fleece? That's when we say, if God, you really love me, you'll open up a parking space for me in the mall. Isn't that a fleece? No, that's not a fleece. A fleece is a, is a, a lamb hide. You have cow hides and other kinds of hides. Uh, a fleece is a lamb hide. That's really what it is. And Gideon says, may that, this lamb hide I have be wet and the ground all around it be dry next morning. And boy, was it wet. He rang, uh, ran, ran, rung out a, a, a bowl full of water. And Gideon knows the next day he's pushing it. But he asked for a third sign, a second fleece. May it be just the reverse tomorrow, which would really be the greater miracle because as, as evaporation goes, here we have the ground uh, 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 around us. The dew on the rock would be dry, but the, the uh, uh, rather the fleece would be dry, the dew around it would be still wet. With evaporation, you would think the, the ground would dry much faster than the the, the lamb hide. And why this is brought up, why does he ask for this fleece? Well, again, we have to go back and see that the Baal, the false gods of their time, Baal was the god of the storm, the god of water, the god of condensation, the god of the weather, the god of dew. In fact, his daughter in the mythology of the Canaanites was named Dewey uh, and, uh, as, as being one with dew. One Ugarit legend has Baal's weakness is because he has a disappearance of dew on the ground. And so this is a shot against Baal. It's a, to boltress up Gideon that Baal is not the Lord, but, but the Lord is the Lord. And that he's sovereign he can go into battle knowing this. Now, how, what's the application? A lot of people take this passage and they say this is a way when we really have prayed and we don't know what God wants and we've talked to people and we've gone to counsel and therefore uh, we have to cast the fleece, right? You've heard that? Casting out a fleece. One of them could be if you really want me to carry out plan A, then please have the phone ring by nine o'clock tonight uh, and then I'll know it's really you, Lord. That's a fleece as it's sometimes practiced in Christianity today. But I would recommend against this. This is not really what this passage is about. It's the only passage that would be a biblical ground for such a fleece. And the passage is not really about a fleece as modern popular Christianity uses it. Why not? Because Gideon wasn't asking for a providential sign of some sort like the phone ringing. He was asking for a miracle. He was asking for an outright miracle. That's not usually what is going on when Christians are asking for fleets. Secondly, it's not the same thing because Gideon wasn't looking for God's will. He already knew God's will. God's will was for him to go into battle. God's will was for him to go into the Midianites. He knew what God wanted him to do. He just needed the courage to do it. And that's not normally what people are doing with fleeces. They're trying to find out the secret will of God. And I, friends, you can't figure that out. I know because I've tried it. You can't figure it out. You can understand the revealed will of God. You can interpret and realize that God is working providentially in your life at times in some really wonderful and in strange ways. But you can't know some specific way of how, who to marry or how many children to have, or whether you should take this job or not. That's not revealed in the scripture, nor are you going to be able to find it out from some secret way or some fleece. I remember doing that. I was actually minister of the gospel. I couldn't figure out if I should go to this church or that church. And so I took two envelopes. One said, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm coming. I'm coming to be your pastor. Another one said, I'm not coming to be your pastor. And I mixed them up so I didn't know which one, and I was going to mail one of them. And then open the other one. Now, no, that's why I'm coming or going. You know, I actually did that. I didn't mail it. Fortunately, it wasn't you. Don't worry about it. It wasn't when I was there. But the mind can get to such a point where we we think we want to know the secret. Well, this is not about this. This is not a biblical text for for knowing the secret will of God. This is a text of showing God's amazing patience with Gideon. God doesn't say, "No, I'm not going to give you a sign." That's stupid, Gideon. You already know what I want you to do. And you're gonna, I told you I'm going to be with you. And I'm going to give you my strength. He doesn't do that. He doesn't mock him. 
He doesn't get angry with him. The Lord works with Gideon as he does with us. God again waits for Gideon. He waits for him to go through these two days of testing. God is showing God's patience. Gideon's sign was unique, but not his struggle. We, are all, our, we have a tendency to wonder, am, am I in the right? Am I doing, am I sure about this? Is, is God's word even true at this point? Will God keep his promises to me? And we sometimes doubt those. It's part of growing as a Christian. Yet God is patient with us. God works with us. God is there. In fact, 2 Peter 3, 9 says to Christians that God is patient with you, not wanting any to perish. Not wanting you to perish. He's going to save you. He's going to take you through. And he goes on in that passage to say the Lord's patience means salvation. The very patience of God shows that he's going to sanctify you over a lifetime. He's going to be patient with you. Now, if you're not a believer this morning, Romans 2.4 tells you that you're not to test the Lord. You're to use the kindness and patience of God waiting for you to come to be a believer. Don't use that. Don't let uh, that uh, just go off the, your back, but come and let the patience of God and the goodness in his, your life so far lead you to Christ. That this God is good and he will stay with you and be with you for all time. And so this shows us the patience of God. God gets through to us, sometimes when we least expect it. And so we shouldn't cast fleece today. We shouldn't demand signs today. But God has clearly said in his word what he wants you to do. And sometimes God gives us providential indications of his care for us. I remember going fishing recently and, and, and I get so excited when I go fishing that I go into the back of the, the car, get the, the rod out and everything and going in so fast that, that I can mess things up. And twice I almost drove off without something that was down there. One time with my watch was in the dirt, the other time uh, about $150 worth of flies were in the dirt. I would have driven off into oblivion without them. And I just reminded me, the Lord takes care of his people. Just a little thing like that. You can think of that. So God sometimes uses providential things in our life, but he always gives signs. God is not an anti-sign person. He gives us signs. He gives us permanent signs. He gives you two signs. One of them is on the table here. The other one is on the other side of the pulpit here. These are the signs that God gives today. God desires that we be assured as we go into the fight. John says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. God wants you to have assurance of your salvation. He wants you to have assurance that he will be with you, that he will sanctify you even today. And he gives you these signs to show that he will be with you, that he will keep his word all the way through your life. We are people who need crutches and he's given us two crutches in the sacraments. God knows that we are dust. He knows how we are formed. He knows what you're like better than you know yourself. He knows, as someone put it, that our knees knock. He knows we're Gideons at heart many times. He knows that we have butterflies in our stomach and that we too will balk. But he's so tender. He's so tender with you, Christian as he was with Gideon. So love him who with love is glowing. God has come to you in Christ. The angel of the Lord, you know, is a, a pre-manifestation of the second person. It's, a, it's a, the, the angel of the Lord, the messenger of the Lord is what it means. Notice how the passage goes back and forth between that, the angel, and then the Lord turns. The Lord is the angel. Yet there's a distinction between the two. It shows us that God has come to us in Christ. 
the angel of the Lord is that son that appears to us in Jesus. It speaks to us in Jesus. Who sits down with us in Jesus. That God's son has even disappeared after his greatest miracle and sign, the resurrection, for the time being. And that God turns to us in Jesus. You see, we have enough evidence for faith and we have enough assurance to take the next step because of Jesus. We can go into the battle this week because he has gone all the way for us in his death and his resurrection. Look at the signs. Look to the signs he's given you and rejoice in your salvation. Let's close in prayer together. Lord, we ask that you might help us see that you do give us signs today, providential signs at times, but always baptism, the Lord's Supper, always. So Lord, give us what we need today as we go to the table. Remind us, even in our reluctance to do your will, even in our, our, our fearfulness before the world, even when we feel like we're going to die, give us assurance to go into the fight knowing you will be with us because of Jesus. And we pray it in his name. Amen.